I am basically here uh, because I intend to tell you how we can solve the climate crisis. About six months ago, a bunch of guys got together at Copenhagen basically with the same idea. Uh, here they are. I mean, they look happy. At least most of them have smiles from ear to ear. But it's weirdly ironic that actually all they, they have to be happy about is their contribution to polluting the atmosphere. Basically, the larger the smile, the greater the contribution in terms of CO2 emissions. <laughs> It isn't really a surprise that the party didn't end well. And, and meanwhile, the world continues uh, to emit, or maybe I should just say pollute, because it's a more straightforward term, because it's more what it actually is. These are the main centers of emission. The United States, the European Union, and China, as you can see in its current uh, form, it's a very, very close contest. Uh, but it doesn't take a lot of imagination to, to see what could happen. Uh, if China continues to develop, and, and basically citizens of China reach parity with US citizens in terms of ecological behavior, uh, this could be our, our future. Basically, before the end of the decade, scientists have predicted that the temperature of the Earth could rise by six degrees with potentially disastrous uh, consequences. If we look at some of the problems that could face us, like sea level rise, deserts as far north as Berlin, melting Eiffel Towers, uh, blackouts at Piccadilly uh, Circus, etc. It's, it's clear that the, the picture is grim. Uh, there are those, in fact, there are many who, in the face of overwhelming evidence, uh, uh, remain skeptical. Uh, in fact, a recent Rasmussen poll uh, shows that uh, about 35% of the people consider it very, very likely that scientists falsify their research, and another 59% considers it reasonably likely. This was a little bit of a strange poll because it was a poll that was supposed to attack the accuracy, the, the numerical accuracy of, of, uh, of climate work, but it's in itself it's a poll that adds up to 120%. <laughs> so, I don't know. Anyway, um, this is a map which shows recent climate incidents, and, and what you can see is that they basically occur so often and they are so prolific that really the term incidents hardly uh, applies. Uh, the costs associated with these incidents is certainly not an incident, but shows a kind of uh, very uh, structural pattern uh, of being on the rise, on the rise, and is it, is beginning to take a real toll uh, on, on on many uh, economies. Um, of course, all of these issues are not new to the world. Uh, uh, quite the contrary, I would say the world is highly aware. Uh, of, of this issue. There's a lot of talk about sustainability. Uh, but it is somehow strange that, that the interventions are, are somewhat modest in, in scale. Uh, therefore, you could say that there is, uh, the, you know, there, the scale of action uh, when it comes to sustainability is inversely proportional to the level of awareness. So it's limited to kind of token products and articles which largely pay lip service to the green course rather than doing something uh, fundamental. Uh, in our view, it was time for a big idea, and a big idea starts at a big scale. So let's say uh, we begin with uh, Europe. What would happen if Europe would decide to cut its emissions by 80% before the year 2050? What would need to happen, and particularly what would need to happen almost the day after tomorrow to make this a reality? Uh, if you look at all sectors of the economy uh, that produce CO2 emissions, uh, and, and, and these are their relative uh, abatements, it basically becomes clear that you cannot reach such your targets if you do not fundamentally transform uh, the energy sector. If you do not fundamentally transform the energy sector from a fossil fuel-driven uh, thing to a renewable thing. And looking at this image of a coal plant in Bergheim, Germany, uh, one really wonder who could ever be against. Um, basically, the proposition uh, at hand is, 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 is a projection where the energy demand keeps on increasing, uh, but proportionally an ever larger and larger share is actually taken by uh, renewable energy sources. Um, of course, Europe looks into this. Uh, again, uh, things like this are happening. Uh, but basically, they happen Europe, the problem with Europe is that it's Europe. 
which means that every action is, is pursued randomly uh, and, and pretty much uncoordinated by individual countries. Currently, we have uh, s uh, the most solar energy in the darkest part of North Germany. Uh, in Sicily, where you have no wind, the Italian mafia collects huge subsidies uh, with, wind, with illegal wind farms, and the Italian police has a special branch uh, to mop them up, which is called Gone with the Wind. I mean, it's largely illustrative for, for how it's currently being uh, pursued. So therefore, from a fragmented entity, Europe needs to turn into an in integrated entity if this ever uh, has to have any hope of success. Basically, the proposition we make is, is very simple. Uh, in the south, you have a lot of sun. In the north, you have a lot of wind. You don't always have sun and you don't always have wind. But the fortunate thing is that you have wind in the north when you don't have sun in the south. You have sun in the south when you have no wind in the north. So basically the north and the south can enter a kind of reciprocal relationship of mutual benefit if there is, uh, in a way, an exchange of these energy sources. Uh, basically, the whole proposition isn't strictly limited to wind. The nice th Europe is large, and Europe is a, a collection of geographically very diverse uh, regions. So the proposition would be uh, basically sun in the south, uh, wind energy in the north, geothermal energy in the center, and hydropower along, in, uh, along the shores. Uh, basically allowing different regions of Europe uh, to enter a, a state of mutual benefit. Uh, Europe, from that point of view, becomes a kind of an, an amalgamation of different regions driven by different sorts of energy. And that led us to basically tentatively redraw the map uh, of Europe. Basically, uh, as a collection of, of regions, or maybe even states, uh, which are no longer national states with a national history, but whose primary, primary driver of identity is the type of renewable energy they, they generate. So in the middle here, uh, we have Geothermalia, uh, and uh, we have basically Solaria in the south, the Isles of Wind, the tidal state, uh, Hydropia. Uh, in the former East Bloc, we have CCSR, the Carbon Capture Storage Republic. <laughs> uh, and Biomassburg, basically at the place of the former Habsburg uh, Empire. Um, Solaria in the south, uh, the tidal states, uh, Biomassburg in the east, uh, Hydropia in the north, and Geothermalia in, in the center. That is our uh, view of a future Europe. Um, of course, the analogy is, is clear, that Europe, almost, that Europe turns properly into a team, like a team of football players with very dedicated uh, roles, uh, all dedicated towards the greater good. Uh, instead of a homogenous entity, Europe could turn into a diverse entity. Uh, Basically, what needs to happen, what really needs to happen to make this a reality is, is a real transformation of, of Europe's energy grid, whereby the uh, possibility of exchange between various regions uh, or countries is drastically enhanced. And really, it's the network that has to turn into the project over the next uh, 40 years. Basically, the network has to acquire a level of consciousness and a level of public uh, acceptance, pretty much like the London Underground, but then at a European uh, scale. Um, this is the existing uh, network, uh, already interconnected to a large extent between countries, uh, mostly linked to fossil fuel sources. Our proposition would be to beef up the transmission capacity by prioritizing elements of that grid into a kind of European energy highways, regionally introduce smart grids, connect those smart grids to whatever is the most appropriate renewable energy source at any given uh, place, and finally, uh, extend that grid into North Africa. Basically, research shows that if you extend the grid into North Africa, before 2050, Europe can be reliant for 100% on renewable energy sources, and fossil fuel will be a thing of the past for good. Uh, Africa has a lot of sun, and clearly Europe stands to benefit from Africa, but by doing such a thing, uh, also Africa could stand to benefit from, from Europe. Europe gets energy. Uh, Africa gets a kind of revenue source that will not run out. Uh, Africa can use this energy for the desalination. Uh, Africa will get jobs. Africa can use the water for a desalination, the energy for a desalination of water. Desalinated water can be used to further agriculture. Agriculture creates more jobs, etc., etc. So, uh, what in management terms is called a win-win situation materializes uh, here. 
uh, a new kind of uh, proximity uh, between Europe and Africa could occur as a, as a result of this. Uh, the last thing, or a significant thing, I guess, to talk about is the cost. Uh, the cost of, of, of investment in order to put something in place is something like six trillion until the, the year 2050, which amounts to about 150 billion per year. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, but I mean, let's just take the mines back for one year to the illegally or to the kind of unjustified bonuses for Wall Street executives, which cumulatively more or less amounted to the same amount of, of money. So yes, it is a lot of money, but at the same time, the current system wastes more or less the same amounts of money that when the investment was redirected could, could significantly help. Um, so this is basically what we think should happen. Uh, that doesn't mean it necessarily happens. Uh, Europe is, is still today planning an enormous amount of, of coal plants for its energy uh, provision, uh, of which it is almost sure uh, that they will be redundant, maybe even before they're built. So what we advocate is a kind of UNESCO policy of prospective preservation, forward-looking preservation, which already invents alternative uses uh, of, for buildings not yet being uh, built. Um, basically, you can, see, you can see that, it, uh, that it's more and more relevant as, as kind of renewable and many renewable energy domains are on the brink of a, of a breakthrough. Uh, enhanced geothermal is, is a technology that is likely to materialize in the very near future. Tidal power is, 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 is undergoing an immense technological development. Uh, Spray-on uh, solar paint cells are being developed. Uh, biomass from algae is being de developed, and ultimately, uh, maybe even body power uh, could be on the cards. The key question is, if we do all of this, what will 2050 look like? And I think one of the most interesting things of, of this project was that maybe 2050 will look just like today. We will have things, those things will move, everything that moves still moves, but it is whatever that makes the things move. Uh, has all completely changed, a kind of an invisible uh, revolution uh, actually dedicated to preserve our way uh, of life, which is currently on collision course with the planet. So the weird realization of this project is that in order for nothing to change, maybe in 40 years we will find out that everything has changed. Thank you very much. Fascinating idea, Anil.